today I want to start something that I, I intend to continue for a number of weeks. As 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 all of us are aware, for days and weeks and months we have focused a lot on the issues that are that are involved in the great controversy. The, the word, the, the, the phrase, the great controversy is something that became very popular through the book that Ellen White wrote. And I myself have read through that book a few times, maybe three or four times. But I would, I would like to start a series of studies. I'd like to start today. And I'm not actually starting today because I'm actually going to go back over vital truths that we have looked at over the past few weeks. So if you ask, why am I going back over it? I, I, I have it in mind that I would like to prepare a book that deals with the theme of this great controversy from the perspective of how we understand the issue. Now, somebody will say, <laughs> I'm being a bit bold because if, if there's already a book by that name, by somebody that most people regard as, as having the, the, the prophetic gift, why would I want to go back over some of that? And to be perfectly frank and honest with everybody in this room, it is because I believe, for whatever reason, there are some major areas in that book. There are some major concepts in the book that I greatly agree with. And there are some major concepts that I believe, well, I'm not going to say they're wrong. I'm going to say I don't agree with them. You can draw your conclusion from that. I think we can only understand our place in this world. We can only rightly fulfill our task in this world as we understand the bigger picture. And as I said, we have tried to look at this week after week, but I, I want to put together a book that deals with the topic. And, and so I'm going to be doing a series of studies, and I'm going to take these studies as the, the, the template for what I'm going to do with this book. So I'm going to start this morning from the beginning, but I would like to label this series. I'd like to label this series. Um, I can't think of a good label. It, it's like all the good, good, good titles have been taken. The Great Controversy, The Cosmic Conflict. I can't think of So I am just going to entitle it for a moment. I'm going to entitle it. The mother of all wars. Okay. Now maybe further down the road, I'm going to change the title. But I, I, I think maybe that will do for the time being. You, 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 you realize that um, the, the, in the book of Revelation in chapter 17, Babylon is called the mother of harlots. And one of the implications is that all harlotry and all the abominations of the earth came about because of Babylon. And so I'm, I'm tentatively wanting to entitle this series of studies, The Mother of All Wars, because what I want to do is to examine the origin and the source and the cause of all wars that have, have, have ever taken place and all the evils that have, have ever taken place. I'm going to go beyond Babylon. And I'm going to go back to the very origins and the very beginning. That's what I have in mind. And um, hopefully, we can take it point by point. I know we have been through many of these points, but I want to, I want to try today to, to start out by step by step, that when we come to the end of the series of studies, anybody in this room and everybody in this room, everybody who goes through this series of studies should understand very clearly how one truth in the Bible connects to another truth and, and why it is so absolutely important that we understand the things that we have been focusing on, all right? They say we're not saved by doctrinal beliefs. Maybe that is true. We're saved by our relationship with Christ, but it is doctrine that serves as a foundation for the relationship. Because if you have wrong doctrine, your relationship is wrong. So doctrine is very important. And the Bible does say that the time will come when, when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
So doctrine is really a statement that means the things you believe concerning your faith. You have to have doctrine, although sometimes people emphasize unimportant doctrine and it becomes tedious and wearisome and people think it's not important. But true doctrine, biblical doctrine, is the foundation of faith. It, it's the basis of what we believe. So doctrine, correct doctrine is very important. So I'm entitling the series, The Mother of All Wars. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to follow a formal sermon format. What I'm going to try to do is to try my best to see if I can get us all to understand the details of what I'm trying to put across, the details and the fine points and the nuances. So if I take my time over one point and I go back over it and I try to find ways to illustrate it, please bear with me. And when we come to the end of the, the day, if we have not finished our agenda, then never mind, we'll pick up next week. So that's how I want to do it, all right? And I hope we can all understand and appreciate that. So today, the title of today's today's chapter, let me call it that way. The title of today's chapter is Origins and Issues. Origins and Issues. And I want to go back to the very beginning. I mean, basically, the point behind this series of studies is that I want to, as far as possible, zoom out as far as I can and look down at what has been happening in, term, in terms of this great conflict, because I do believe that the people who can see from a distance, who can take a, what I call a macro view, they are the people who will have the best understanding. And the people with the best understanding are the people who will be able to relate to it in the best way. I believe that the better we understand what is happening, the better we can fall in line with God's purposes, all right? So I'm saying all of this because I'm, I'm justifying my reason. I'm justifying myself in going to this theme and possibly going over it again and again, in spite of the fact we have covered many of these things in the past. So I want to talk about origins and issues today. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that something that is superficial and simple, but there is a God. There is a God. And if that sounds really trite and trivial, like, why do I even need to say this? The reason is I, 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 I like to go back to the, the most basic question of all. And the most basic question is, is there a God? Because the way we answer this question determines how do we see life? And how do we, we relate to life and where are we going in life? The, 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 those of us who stop to think about it will always conclude that there is a God. I, I asked myself this question when I was about eight years old. And from the time I was about eight years old, or maybe I don't remember exactly what age, but I've been contemplating these questions. Like, where did God come from? And how do we know there is a God? But the, the older I grew and the more I could think, the more I recognized that I exist. I am here. Everybody is here. So where did we come from? And it began to become more a strong conviction that there has to be a God. There's no way I can exist. There's no way we can exist. We had to come from somewhere. I didn't create myself. I don't know where I came from. So the idea of a God, a supernatural great being who ultimately created everything, the more you understand about nature and science and philosophy and theology, the more you are convinced there is a God. So the ultimate reality is God. There is a God. There is a great source of all things. Now, as I said last night, most people in the world believe that there's a God, apart from some crazy people who believe that we all came from modern slime and microbes. Most people believe that there's a God. But the, the, the problem is that the vast majority of people in the world have confused ideas about God. Some people believe that God is like a universal, a cosmic force. Some people believe God is the universal consciousness of all living things. Some people believe God is like a, a pantheon of many different 
beings, some people believe God is three entities, all kinds of ideas. But our faith is based on the Bible. I'm not going to I'm going, I'm not going to touch upon the upon that question at all. That to me is sacrosanct. I'm I'm in this room and I'm talking to people who believe in the Bible. So on the basis of the Bible, what we come come to understand is that there is one person who is God. In the ultimate sense, there's one God. There is a being who was before all beings. There's somebody who is the source of everything. There was a time when there was nothing. There was a time when there was no air. There was no time. There was no space. There was no being. There was nothing. But there was God. There was always God. Now, how do you explain that? Well, if you can, you're a better person than I am. The more you think about this, the more you recognize that you have to accept your limitations. There is a God and he's the source of all things. Now, I'm going to also say without trying to prove it that this God, way back in the days of eternity, he begot, he brought forth somebody in his image and this person was the begotten son of God. Now, I'm not going to take the time to to prove or to demonstrate this today, but I just want to highlight what this relationship was like. And what I mean by this is that the person that was brought forth was the exact image of God in terms of his nature and his character. And when I say this, I mean that he had the same kind of heart like God. He had the same kind of attitude like God. But he was not God in the sense that the father was God because the father is the great original and the father is the source of all things and all power, almighty power belongs to the, that original God. But his son was, was brought forth from his own person, from his own being. And so he has the same attributes as the father in terms of his nature and in terms of his character. And right at this point, I want to just hi highlight a, a principle. The Bible says that, you know, when God created creatures, he, he designed, he ordained that everybody brings forth after his own kind. Everybody brings forth in his own image. So Adam begot a son in his image. But what we understand is that Adam's son was not the exact image of God. I'm sorry, not the exact image of Adam. And why was this so? It was because there was a woman involved. There was somebody else involved. The son that was born could not be exactly like Adam because there was a third party involved. And that third party also influenced the child that was born. In the case of God's son, the son that God brought forth back in the days of eternity, there was no mother there was only the father and so this son was the exact representation of his father's nature and character all right so that's where we go we go back to the exact the beginning and you know the thing is that the bible does not say a lot about what things were like back in the beginning before the world was created. How much, how much can you find in the Bible about the, the universe before the world was created? You don't find a lot. I've searched, I've thought about it, I've looked in the Bible. It doesn't say much at all about the universe before the creation of the world. So how do we know what kind of condition it was in? Well, there are some clues in the Bible, and I'm going to look at some of these clues and kind of, let me see, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to jot down a few notes on the screen because... What I want to do is, is to make sure that, you know, the things that I'm saying kind of stick in our minds. So I want to, um, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, let me see, how can we do this? All right. You should be able to see a very blank screen. All right, so I'm going to scribble on this screen the things that I want to say. And I'm hoping that as I scribble on the screen, all right, good. I'm hoping that as I scribble, you will be able to um, 
better remember the things that I want to talk about, all right? So the first thing I want to point out about the original state of the universe was that it was in a state of unmarred happiness. All right, these are just my words. These are just things I want to emphasize. The, the, the first thing is that the universe was originally in a state that I would refer to as, when I say unmarred, I mean that there was no shadow. There was nothing that came into the picture that could have caused unhappiness. You know, Daniel was just talking about this just a while ago. If we go to Revelation chapter 21, I don't know, I think Daniel commented on this verse, but I'm going to reemphasize it. Revelation 21 and verse 4. Um, now, I probably could bring up the verse here, but I don't want to jump from screen to screen. So let me just read the verse. It says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. It's talking about in the future. But it shows you God's ideal, what God is after, what God wants. And it says, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. So just to quickly scribble down of what he says will pass away. He says there'll be no more debt, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. So what I'm going to I'm going to suggest to you is that we can assume that in the pre in the pre in the pre-universe, before the world was created, when everything was perfect, these things didn't exist. No death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. In other words, I, 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 I'm focusing on something that all of us knows, right? We all know that these things weren't there. But sometimes I'm going back to the basic. I'm going back to the very beginning. I'm looking at origins. And I, I don't want us to take anything for granted. I want us to take these things that we take for granted, and I want us to look and, and, and to say, do we find this in the Bible? In that, in that pre-sin universe, what was it like? We can assume when you look at what God is going to create in the future, what it must have been like. There was no sorrow, no pain, no crying. Nobody was ever sad. Nobody ever died. Daniel pointed out that they lived happily ever after. Well, in this case, they lived happily before as well. You know, sin came in, and so things changed, but they lived happily. And um, that was the state of the universe. Now, what was the source of this unmarred happiness? I'm going to ask a question. Okay, let me write it down. What was the source? What was the source of this happiness? And when I say happiness, of course, I mean happiness, peace, joy, blissfulness, unshadowed joy. What was the source of it? Where did it come from and how did it exist? I'm asking the, the, the simple questions. I'm asking the simple questions because sometimes they are the most important things of all what was the source you, you know sometimes i mean people take things for granted and they think that um okay this just existed okay but you have to ask the question if this just existed why doesn't it exist today if if happiness and peace and joy are things that just exist by themselves why doesn't it exist today? Why is the world so full of unhappiness and, and sorrow and, and all of the, the, these, these confusing and painful issues? Why? There is a reason and there is a source. So I'm asking you, what was the source of this original happiness? And I, I, I am making this point because I think we have to establish this from the very beginning. If you don't understand where you're coming from, you're not going to understand where you are going. This whole thing that we call the great controversy are the mother of all wars. 
You can't understand it until you understand the foundation principles of what the beginning was like. So we have to get that right. We have to get that right. And I, I'm going to emphasize that a little bit more as we proceed. So the basis of this, of this happiness. Now I'm going to put something to you. I'm going to write something else. The basis of it. The basis of it was kind of like what Daniel was highlighting this morning. Well, let me put it a little different, differently. The basis of this happiness was voluntary. I'm going to highlight this again. Voluntary submission to God. As a matter of fact, I should put this as number 3A, because I don't think that was the only thing. 3A, voluntary submission to God. Then 3B, God living in his intelligent creation. Okay, now I'm going to say in a moment that if you have any, any burning question, I will allow it, all right? I, I, I have seen people put up notices on Facebook where they say people keep dragging, not on Facebook, on, on YouTube. They say people keep dragging the discussion off track and it confuses them. I've seen somebody put up a notice like it, a note like that this week and I'm thinking about it because I don't want to confuse people. But at the same time, I know that sometimes I'm writing something and I'm trying to explain something and you don't quite get it. And I don't want to be talking in a vacuum and I don't want to be saying something and I've lost you. So if there's something that needs clarification, I say stop me and ask me to clarify. I, I want to clarify, okay? But if you are understanding perfectly, don't stop me. Let's keep the, the flow going that we don't confuse the people on YouTube, all right? Okay. So I'm, I'm going somewhere with all of this, but I, I, I'm wanting to look at the source, the source, the beautiful harmony and peace and perfection that existed in the universe. What was the source of it? Where did it come from? What was the reason and the basis for it? That's the question I'm asking. Because if you get that question wrong, you're going to get the end of the story wrong. Because what you are looking for, what we are looking for today, and what we are looking for at the end of the road is what existed in the beginning. Whatever caused them to, to be so happy and peaceful and, and, and perfect, whatever gave that state to them is what we should be aiming for. Because that was God's perfect universe. And that's where we are looking to go back to. So we need to understand this. What was the source of this happiness? I'm putting some things on the screen. I, I, I put, first of all, that it was a voluntary submission to God. Now, this morning, I think these two questions were asked, okay? Even when Brother Joel asked this question afterwards, it was kind of focused on how we balance these two things, all right? And maybe I should put... 3B at 3A, but let's take, it, let's take it in this order. The first thing, the first thing that was so important is God, is God living in, hold on a second, I need a much bigger highlighter. Is God living in his intelligent creation? I'm going to explain why in a moment. The second thing is voluntary submission to God, okay? God lives in his creatures, but look here. Even although God lived in Satan, God lived in Lucifer. How did Lucifer manage to go astray if God was living in him? Are we going to say the spirit of God was not in Lucifer? Are we going to say there was a creature in heaven who did not have God living inside of him? No. The other, the other the other quality that is vitally important is our input, our choice. God, God provides everything we need 
to live this life of happiness and perfection. But one thing God will not do is take away our power of choice. That's absolute. That's a foundation stone in this, in this universe that God will not remove our power of choice. And that power of choice is the weak spot in perfection. Even though power of choice is so necessary to perfection and to happiness, because if you take away my power to choose, I'm not going to be happy. Even if, 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 if my wife, in my relationship with my wife, if she takes away my power to choose, if I don't have the power to choose another woman, choosing her means nothing. I'm just choosing her because I'm a puppet. I need to have the power to choose. And then when I choose her, it means something. And furthermore, it makes me happy if, if I only, if I only am loyal to my wife and I treat my wife in a loving way because I am compelled to, to do it. Sister Natalie is the only woman I can see on the screen, but I will tell you, Sister Natalie, if, 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 if your husband says, I love you, because there's a recording in his voice box and every morning he gets up. I love you so much. You are so beautiful. You are so nice. It's his voice. The statement is coming out of his mouth and you know it's a recording. Or you know somebody compels him to do it. You, that means nothing to you unless you're an idiot. This power of free choice is one of the greatest gifts that God has given to his creatures and it is still the greatest the greatest opening for rebellion, free choice. So God has given us, God gave his creation everything that they needed. He gave them his, his own life. And I'll explain why in a moment. But even possessing the life of God, it's like Paul says, if we live in the spirit, what should we do? Let us walk in the spirit. We have a choice. We have a choice. God gives us what we need, everything that we need. It is the power of God. It is the enabling of God. It is the, the, the will of God, but I have the final say because I was made free. This little formula that you see right here, brothers and sisters, was the source of this universal happiness. God lived in his creation and the creation was voluntarily submissive to God. And that was is a formula for perfection. It was so at the beginning, it was so when the church was strongest of all and most vibrant, and it will be so when everything is perfect again. This is the key. Now, this, this, where does this voluntary submission come from? Where does it come from? And I'll make this point number four. Where does this voluntary submission come from? Ah, sorry about that. Um, it comes from it comes from first of all, trust. And what's another word for trust? We call it faith. And love for God. All right, these these are very important principles here, and I don't know. We, we are going to be be spending some time, probably a few weeks, maybe even going into months, focused on this. So, what I want to do is to highlight. I hope that we'll be able to find a way to um remind ourselves of these things because they are foundation principles and I, we will come back to them from time to time but still they are so important i want us to remember and not miss the point that we are looking at the, the, these these things that are highlighted they are very important they are, they, are, they are foundations that we will come to again and again so starting from number four we love god and we trust god so what do we do we submit to god and god has already given us his life and because we love God and we trust God and we submit to God. What happens is that we are happy. We are at peace and the universe is in a state of perfection. You see how one thing is connecting to another thing. 
all right? I'm starting, I'm, if we start from the bottom, I started from the top, all right? But if we start at the bottom, and as a matter of fact, you know that Jesus said it. If you go to um, John 14, let me read this. And again, I'm not bringing the Bible on the screen, but there are verses that we know, and you can look at your own Bible in this case. Look at what Jesus says. Same principle, an eternal principle. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. Jesus is speaking in John 14. I'm at verse 21. The one who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loveth me. Why do we keep his commandments? Because we love him. In verse 23, he says the same thing again. If a man love me, he will keep my words. Why do we keep his words? Because we love him. Love is a foundation. That is why he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is, this is the basis and the foundation on which God establishes his kingdom. It's because we love him and we trust him. If you want to ask the question, why is faith so important in the Christian economy? Why does Jesus say, he that believeth in him is not condemned? He that believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Why is faith so important? It's because faith is the foundation. If you don't trust God, you can't love God. And if you don't love God, you will not submit to God. And if you don't submit to God, you will never, ever be happy. And the universe will never be at peace. Because if you don't submit to God, you will not accept God into your life. Do you see? The people who surrender to God and accept God into their lives are the people who trust and love God. It's like in a sensible marriage. In a sensible marriage, why does a woman allow a man into her life? Well, these days they do it for money, right? These days they do it for money. And sometimes it used to be because there was arranged marriages. But in a sensible marriage, you let a man into your life because you love him and you trust him. If you don't love him and you don't trust him, woman, you're a fool. Because he's going to take advantage of you and use you and then leave you and he might beat you, put on top of it. So woman, and it might work the other way too in some cases, but you let somebody into your life because you love the person and you trust the person. And that is how it works in the Christian economy. We love God and we trust God. And so God, we, we let him into our lives. And when we let him into our lives, we continue to submit to him. And this is where happiness and peace comes from. This was how it was in the beginning in a perfect universe. Let's get this right. So, notice the emphasis here. Notice the emphasis. What is the basis and the foundation of what we are looking at? This is so important. Where did my thing go? Oh, here it is. Right. This is what we are looking at. Number five. It was, it was built. It was focused. This, this whole security of the universe was focused on personal. Personal relationship. with God. Personal relationship with God. And I want to highlight the important words here as well. Personal relationship with God. Why is this so important? Well, I'm, I, I'm going to come to the point, but I might forget it. So let me just say it from here. It's because there are so many people who believe that so many people who believe that the, the, the whole issue was an issue of obedience to a set of rules. Let me say that again, because maybe it, it, it passed over your head. And I want you to understand and to remember, many people believe that the whole issue was everybody was happy because they were obeying a set of rules. They think they think that the issue in the universe was conformity to a set of rules. And as long as you obeyed the rules, you were happy. And when you broke the rules, that's when the problem began. But I wanted to look at what I have on the screen and you will understand that the problem was not the rules themselves. The problem was the personal relationship. What is the basis of relationship? Love and trust. 
What is the consequence of that love and trust? Submissiveness. What is the consequence of that submissiveness? God comes to live inside. What is the consequence of God living inside? Happiness and peace. Universal joy and perfection. So you see, it all starts with a relationship with God. It's not the rules that are important. Those are secondary. What is important is what is the state of your relationship with God? I really hope everybody is understanding what I'm saying because this is most important. Now, what the Bible teaches us, what the Bible teaches us is that something disastrous happened. Something disastrous happened. There was a rebellion. All right, rebellion. There was a rebellion. And the thing about it is that, again, I want to emphasize, how do you have a rebellion in a perfect universe? How do you have a rebellion in a universe where everybody loves God and trusts God? How do you have a rebellion in a place where you have this kind of system? Love God, submit to God, God lives inside and you are perfect. How do you have a rebellion in that system? It comes back to that point that I made at the beginning. And maybe I should write that down at the top. This is the most important principle in this, in this universe. Free choice. This is the cause. This is a source of happiness and it's a source of sin. Free choice. And yet it had to exist. God could not create a happy universe without creating freedom of choice. But that freedom of choice opened the door for somebody like Lucifer. Now, let's, let's look at what the Bible says about Lucifer. Again, I'm going to read, okay? I don't want to take my screen off. Now, it's going to be, get too complicated if I start doing that. But let me, let me um, focus. First of all, in John 8 and verse 44. Very well known verse. Look at what Jesus says. He says to the, 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 the scribes and Pharisees. He says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires are the lusts of your father, you will do. Look at what Jesus says now. He was a murderer from the beginning. So what Jesus is telling us is that in the beginning, and I don't know, of course, when he says the beginning here, he's not he doesn't mean when he was created. We're going to see it doesn't mean when he was created. But it means from the beginning of the problem of sin, Lucifer had the spirit of a murderer. So what Jesus is showing us is that somewhere in that, in that land of, it, of bliss and happiness, something happened. Somebody, now, you know, as, I'm, as I said, we are looking at things that you know like the back of your hand. But what I like to do is take things that are taken for granted and I want to examine them and look at the biblical basis for what we believe, right? Because when you have a biblical basis, nobody can deceive you anymore. I want us to take those simple Bible passages and explore and get them right that nobody can deceive you anymore. Once you see it for yourself, once you have examined it yourself, you are on solid ground. So, Jesus says, at the beginning, something happened. Somebody in that, in that place of perfect happiness developed the spirit of a murderer. We're going to see how in just a moment. But what else does he say? He says he, he, he was a murderer from the beginning and he abode not in the truth. So what does that tell us? That he was a liar. If you don't abide or you don't stay in the truth, you're a liar. And because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and he is a father of it. Notice, although it says that he was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus is emphasizing here his tendency to lie. He was a liar. He's a liar and he's a father of it. Um, this phrase, he is the father of it. Let me write that down. He is a father of lies. That's how Jesus describes Satan. And um, the verse is John, John 8. I'm writing it here because you're not actually seeing the screen. 
John 8 and verse 44, Jesus is the father of life. And I, I just am emphasizing it because, you know, as I said, I'm entitling the series, The Mother of All Wars. And I'm showing you how the Bible uses the word father and mother in this context, because when it says he was a father of lies, it means he was the originator. He's the one who invented lies. He's the cause of lies. He's, he's the source from which all lies flowed. So Jesus says the outstanding mark of Satan and what he did at the beginning was that he was a liar. Bible says so. So we get an idea of the nature of his rebellion. Now I'm going to go to another verse in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Let me scribble that down also. You're not seeing the screen. If you want to take a note of these verses, let me write them down so you can see them. Ezekiel 28, and I'm going to read from verses 14 to 17. All right. Now, Jesus says, or the Bible says, Thou art, or you are, this is speaking of Satan. You are the anointed cherub that cover it. You are the anointed angel. He, there was a special angel, he's called a, a, a cherub, a cherubim, that cover it. And I have set thee so. God says he gave this angel the job of covering. Some people believe, and it could very well be, that he was, he was a, appointed to stand at the throne of God and to spread his wings over the throne, like you see happening in the, in the, in the sanctuary on the mercy seat. All right, that, that's quite likely, quite possible. He was standing in the presence of God. Look at the privileges he has. God says, he's talking about something here that I don't understand and nobody understands. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Okay, that probably means heaven. But it says, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. I don't know what that means because I've never seen heaven. But he had special privileges. That's what God is trying to show us. And then God says, thou wast perfect. You were perfect in your ways. All his ways were perfect. He was living, he was, he was living in a personal relationship with God. Point number five. He trusted God and he had love for God. Point number four. He submitted to God. Point number three A. And so you had point number four, four B, three B. God was living in him. And the consequence was that. He was happy. And this is what constituted his perfection. God says you were perfect from the day that you were created until one day iniquity was found in you. Now, I ask you the question, where did this iniquity arise from if iniquity was found in him? This iniquity, brothers and sisters, had to come from only one place, and it's what we mentioned already. This in iniquity came from free choice. He was made free. God never gave him, made him with iniquity. God never made mm. him to be a sinner. God never made him to be cursed. But he was made free. Mm. He was given free choice. And out of his free choice, iniquity arose in him. Now, I want you to look again. Look at this. Look at this sequence here. Let me use a different color. So, look at this sequence here, brothers and sisters. All right. Where do you think iniquity started? Like I said, we are taking our time because I want us to understand thoroughly. Where did iniquity start? Okay, we say that the reason, the reason for it was free choice, okay? He was free. But he was free, and what did he do with his freedom? He must have started at number five. Let us say number four. He broke his trust in God. He stopped trusting God. His love for God diminished. And so number 3A, he would no longer submit to God. That's where it began, and that's how it developed. He stopped trusting God. Now, how do you stop trusting somebody? I want to do this for all of us. All of us, I think, maybe are, are, all I can see on the screen, I assume, are married people or have been married. At some point, I did a brother Joel, brother Ian, brother Judah, sister Natalie, sister Mariana, and myself. All of us have had experience in marriage, I think, or we have had experience in relationships. Where do they break down? 
Mm. Even for those who are still married, where do they break down? They break down when you stop trusting the person and you stop loving the person. Sometimes mm. love comes afterwards. You stop trusting the person, number one, and then you stop loving the person. Mm. Or sometimes love remains in some kind of way, but you no longer trust the person. You don't, you don't, you don't understand the way the person behaves. You can't have confidence in the person's behavior anymore. That's a lack of trust. And sometimes it's the person who is no longer trustworthy. Sometimes it's your perspective that becomes distorted. Sometimes. Sometimes it's because you have selfishness in your heart why you lose that trust and why you choose to lose that trust. But what happens now is that you no longer voluntarily submit to the person. You are no longer living in harmony because you don't trust the person. The person says, let's do this, and you say, I'm going to do that. The person says, let's go east, and you say, I'm going west. You don't trust the person anymore to walk in harmony with the person. And the consequence is that your relationship is broken. Your peace and your harmony goes. Mm. This is what happened to Lucifer. In his case, why did he stop trusting mm. God? It was because he started focusing on himself too much. He mm. focused on himself to the point where he could no longer see God. You know what Daniel was saying this morning? Mm. That, and, and other people were commenting on it. By looking at that thing too long, you become like that thing. He looked at himself until he could no longer see God. That is why it is a mm. curse for people to be focused on these selfies and to be absorbed in themselves, we find it distasteful. And it, but it's not only distasteful, it's dangerous when a person becomes absorbed in himself. Because then you stop seeing in a balanced way and self takes you over. This freedom to choose where you look, this is what destroyed Lucifer. He had the freedom to choose where to look, where to focus his attention, and he chose himself. Brother Aaron had one question. If you give him a break, we can say, well, it was the first time. Mm -hmm. How could he have known? Maybe you could say something like this, but the point mm -hmm. is, whether it was the first time or the second time, mm -hmm. that is the consequence of what happened. He made the wrong choice. God says he was mm -hmm. perfect till iniquity was found in him, and that iniquity was based mm -hmm. on his breaking his trust in God. That's where it started. Brother Ian, go ahead. I just want to ask you, that, um, Sister Iris, to mute your oh, microphone. It's becoming very distracting. Say, say that again. Say again. Uh, somebody, I uh, think Sister Iris' mic is unmuted and it's, mm -hmm. it's distracting. I beg your pardon because I had turned down my audio for some mm -hmm. reason and I wasn't hearing. So let me just mute everybody. Uh, okay. Now, if there's anybody who has a question that you really have to ask, you can unmute and go ahead. All right. Good. So, the, 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 the God says iniquity was found in Lucifer. And when people, people like to ask this question, where did sin come from? They say if God made everything perfect, how could, how could sin arise? In this that we have on the screen, the answer is before your eyes. Free choice is the reason why sin arose. And yet God could not make the creation without free choice. He would have made a creation of robots. If you understand this, you can at least have some understanding that even though it is called a mystery of iniquity, you can have an idea of how it developed and where it went and how it got to this place. And not only this, not only can we look at the past, but we can get a good idea of how to move forward into the future. We can get an idea of what we need to keep our eyes upon and where we need to be focused on. So, the Bible gives us clear evidence that there was a rebellion. Now, what was the focus of this rebellion? Yeah, we know that Satan was focused on himself. I mean, if you go to Isaiah 14, and if you start from about verse 14, you can get a clear idea of what was the whole point of this rebellion. What was the seed of it? And it says that Lucifer says, in verse 13, God says of Lucifer, you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. That, that verse is so perfect in demonstrating what happened because everything is I, 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 I. Five or six times he says, I will, I will, I will. It was self-centeredness. Um, Sister Bobby, I think your mic is unmuted. 
Oh, I'm sorry. All right. No problem, Sister Bobby. I'll mute everybody again. Okay, so we we see that the focus was Satan, but in terms of the the method of his rebellion, what was it that he focused on in his rebellion? And the reason I'm asking this this question is because it is popularly believed, all right? And I'm not even going to touch on where this idea comes from, but I wanted to think about it. It is popularly believed that what happened in, in heaven was that Satan said, Lucifer said, it is impossible to keep the law of God. Has anybody heard that? You never heard that? Okay, well, I heard it and I read it many times that the reason for the rebellion in heaven. <laughs> okay, so, you, okay. Yeah, the, it is said that the reason for the rebellion in heaven was that Lucifer said it was not possible for anybody to keep the law of God. And there is no place I can find in the Bible where such an idea is presented. And if you look at what we are examining here, you will see that what we find is that, first of all, there's a self-centeredness. He's focused on himself. He wants, he has ambitions to be like God in some kind of way, which we are going to examine thoroughly, maybe not today, but we are going to examine all of these things very carefully. So he wants to be like God. But not only this, here's the second, here's the, here's the focus of his rebellion. Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. Jesus said that he was a liar from the beginning. All right, and maybe when Jesus said this, he had this very verse in mind. It's Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. You know it so well. It won't matter that it is not on the screen, but I wanted to look at what happens. It says, and the woman said unto the serpent, you shall not surely die. The woman has just told the serpent, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither touch it, lest you die. And the serpent says, barefacedly, in, 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 in barefaced denial of God, you shall not surely die. So what is Satan trying to do? He's trying to bring Eve to the same place where he is. Number four, he doesn't trust God. He doesn't love God. And he's trying to bring Eve to the same place because he knows that if he can get her to break number four, number three will be gone. And when number three goes, number two will be gone. And what he will have is a set of people. He will have a nation. He will have a world in rebellion against God in the same place where he is. Now, look, somebody will say, but what he got Eve to do was to disobey a law. Fair enough, fine enough. But how did he get Eve to disobey that law? We see the prelude or the preamble to the act of disobedience. And where does it begin? It begins with saying, God is a liar. It begins with saying, God is a liar. He's breaking Eve's confidence in God. He's, he's, he's at point number four. And he wants to break that personal relationship, God has been their friend. God comes into the garden and talks with them every day. He wants to break this relationship and he starts by creating doubt. Brothers and sisters, in my years, I have learned the power of this, okay? My family will tell you that sometimes we, we, we get together and we talk about things. And I, I, I often say to them, be careful what you say, okay? We, we, we are guilty like everybody else. Sometimes we sit down and we talk about people and we talk about things. But I always try to caution them. I say, be careful. Because you know what? The more that you say that is negative about a person, the more your mind changes about that person. The words that you say are affecting your thinking and you begin to think negatively of a person sometimes more than is merited. And when you break your confidence in a person, when your trust in a person is broken, the relationship starts going downhill. You see what I'm saying? So, oh, he David. was trying to... Yes, Brother Mark. He, my but friend... let, me just, let me just finish my sentence. He was trying to break their confidence in God, thereby breaking their relationship with God. And he knew at this point, he could get them then to be disobedient to God and eliminate God out of their lives. Go ahead, Brother Matt. 
what you're saying makes a lot of sense. I, I just thought that could it be possible that the, the same tool that Lucifer used on, well, Satan used on Eve was the same thing that happened to him. Maybe there was some kind of action that God took that Satan misunderstood or doubted God's purpose and something developed inside of him to cause him to distrust. It makes uh, sense. I mean, it, it, yes, Brother Matt, I, I, I see what you're saying and it's possible. And if we think about it, you could ask, what could God do to make him stop trusting God or cause unbelief in his heart? Now, some have suggested, okay, and again, I'm not calling any names, but some have suggested that what he did was he, he exalted Jesus. And when he exalted Jesus, Satan felt disrespected or neglected. Some have suggested this. Now, there are certain questions that arise when you take this point of view. Number one is, you mean to say that all the years of eternity that they had been together? Because nobody knows how long the universe existed before Earth was created. But let us say, at some point, suddenly God says, I'm going to exalt my son. And all of a sudden, it, Lucifer becomes jealous of Jesus. Maybe it was that way. To be honest, it's not in the Bible. And so it's a speculation, which you know we can all speculate. And I'm not saying it isn't so. But whatever it is, the whole point is, it began with Lucifer thinking too highly of himself. And in, in consequence, he stopped trusting God. Whatever the reason. Whatever the reason, whether there was any, any event that took place in heaven that made him start to think this way, whatever the reason, the bottom line is the, the, the root of the problem was his absorption with himself and losing love and faith in God. That was the problem. And I think you can see that even in, 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 in our experience in this, in this age of sin, we ourselves, that's our great danger. You, you come upon a situation that you didn't expect. Something happens that makes you think, why is God not answering? And what happens? You start losing trust in God. You stop praying, and because you stop doing these things, your love for God diminishes, and you drift away from him. Your relationship with God is breaking down. That's the danger, and it always was the danger, and it always will be the danger. So, what was the focus of Satan's rebellion? When you look at what he said, God knows, God knows that in the day you eat of this fruit, your eyes shall be open and you shall become like God, knowing good and evil. It, it, it's as transparent as glass. It's as plain as day. What Satan was saying is, God is keeping you from something good. He tried to break their confidence in God by making out that God had impure motives. Look, I could live on this all day today talking about this. There are so many ideas in Christendom that are so unworthy. So many ideas that tell the same lie like Satan was telling. They make out that God is pretending. They make out that God is, 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 is play acting. They make out that God is only acting in a role. They have all these confused lies about God out there. And people, they are into religion. But they don't really know God and they don't really trust God because their minds have been perverted by bad ideas. That's why we have to go through this series of studies and everybody has to understand because the world needs answers, brothers and sisters. And it does not have them. And these are the kinds of things that I am, I am burdened to bring before the world that the world might truly know the kind of person God is. So what was Satan attacking? What was Satan attacking? Let me um let me just write it here. What Satan was attacking was two things. First of all, number one, let me use block. Number one, Satan's attack. And I'm going to make this point, and it's probably it's probably maybe the final point I'll make today. As I said, we're going to continue this for quite some time we're going to go through this thoroughly but the first point that satan attacked was god's character on the writing god's character what what did i have sorry 
Sorry, guys. God's character. All right, God's character. That was the first point that he attacked. There are two things that Satan attacked, and we're going to explore these more fully in coming in coming weeks. But he, uh, he attacked God's character. That was number one. And number two, he attacked God's government. I would also like us to remember this. I'd like us to remember this. And um, it's something I would ask us not to forget. These are the two points of attack. All right. I'm going to add something else at the bottom. Okay, I'm going to add something else. But it's not really so much an attack. The third thing, the third issue that was at stake was man's salvation. This came up afterwards. Okay. This came up afterwards, but there are three issues. There are three great issues before the universe. One of them is Satan attacked God's character. Secondly, Satan attacked God's government. And thirdly, he enticed the human race. You could say that the human race was an innocent third party. Okay. A conflict broke out between God and Satan. And human beings got caught in the middle. We were like an innocent third party. And, and I, I know I know there's so much evil here. We can condemn human beings. But you know, ultimately, brothers and sisters, we are victims. I didn't ask to be born here. You didn't, uh, you didn't ask to be born in this world. You weren't here when Adam sold us out to Satan. Where were you? We are victims. I, 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 the more I understand this, the more I can... I can be patient and give myself a little time when I find myself falling into all kinds of foolishness. I give myself some time because I realize I, I, am, I, I was born into a diseased place with a disease in me. And it might take a little while for me to recover completely in terms of my thinking and all the rest of it. But the point is, these three issues are before God and before the universe. Number one, God's character. Number two, God's government. And number three, the, the, the third party, those that were caught in the middle, God also has a responsibility or he has given himself the responsibility of finding a way to bring these people back into a place of safety. These are the three issues before the universe. And I'll just touch briefly on the first two. God's character. Satan said that God is a liar. If you go to the book of Job, you see where Satan is attacking God's government. You see where Satan, Satan says to God, Job is not, is not fearing you. God, Job is not serving you for nothing. There's a reason why Job is serving you. Job is serving you because you are showing favor to Job. What he's really questioning is God's method of obtaining loyalty. He's saying the way you go about things is unfair and unreasonable. It's not, it's not your system of government it's not your way of life that job admires job is under serving you because he can get benefit these are not the details the exact details of what the whole issue is about but it kind of shows you that satan is attacking two things in the garden of eden he attacked god's character he made out that god was a liar in the book of job here he's attacking god's way of governing god's way of obtaining a relationship with job and these are the two things that he attacks now, I think I'm going to leave the details of this system of government until next week. I'm just going to mention briefly, as you look at what we have on the screen, point number 3A and point number 3B, these are the bases, the fun fundamental bases of God's government. Number one, we submit to God. And number two, God lives inside of his intelligent creation. This is God's way of government. Notice the two elements that are there. Voluntary submission to God. Why voluntary submission? Because we love and trust God. If you can break that love and trust, nobody will submit to God. They might go through the forms of serving him, like many Christians do, but they don't really submit to him. Their hearts don't really belong to him. They don't have a relationship with him. What they are involved in is what I call formula religion. They go through the formula because that's what they know, but they don't know God. They go through the formula. They go through the details like, like the Jews kept the laws. They went through the formula. They didn't know the God of the law. 
because they didn't love him nor trust him. They never knew him. That is the danger in religion today. Going through the formula without knowing the God, without knowing God himself. I want to say that sometimes the formula is relevant. All right? We do things the proper way. But look, you do things the proper way. You set the table before you eat. You sit down with your with, with, with your wife and eat. Okay? You sit down with your family and eat or whatever you do. You, you follow the formula. But do you think that that is the foundation of your, your home? Do you think that is the foundation of your home? Do you think you can go through this and then you don't, you don't have any discussions or communication with your wife? You don't hug her. You don't spend time to her. You don't do those on, on, on timetabled things. Those things that are outside of the formula. The formula is just the structure that surrounds the relationship. The relationship is you and the person, heart to heart, face to face, mouth to mouth, life to life. That is relationship. That is relationship. And that is my religion. And it is to be your religion. And it will always Amen. be my religion. Because when you have that Amen. relationship, look, you might forget the formula. You might overlook the formula. It doesn't matter. Or it doesn't matter that much. That is why David could go into the, the temple and eat the showbread unspecified in the law, contrary to the law. But he knew the God of the law. The relationship made him do things that the formula people cannot do. All right, my time is up. We have started. And I promise that we are going to continue. And we're going to take our time. I'm not going to rush at all.